So, social media is up in arms about a local Malaysian politician who says that it would be good for rape victims to marry their rapists. That it would be a good solution in his mind. Malaysians of all stripes are condemning him. And rightly so. But what no one has said so far, and I run in Christian circles, what no one has said so far is that this jives with Old Testament law as well. In the Old Testament, it was law that a rapist, if caught would have to marry his victim he would have to pay the bride price and marry her what do you make of that what do you make of that especially in light of a favorite quotes of some christians that the law of the Lord is perfect and abides forever. Surely this statute of the Mosaic law cannot abide in the 21st century. And I know of no Christians who would encourage this law to be enacted or to be a follower and rightly so if you turn the clock back maybe four millennia five millennia it might be good for the girl to marry the rapist because in that society no one else might want to marry her. Sad, but true. That's the society that existed four or five millennia ago in that place. Maybe four or five thousand miles from where I am. But it doesn't apply now, does it? In the 21st century. So that law in that context might have been a good law to protect a rape victim from becoming a destitute widow, potentially even dying from hunger and being ostracized. So the law of Moses required a rapist to marry his victim and pay the bite bright price the dowry to her father and if she did not want to marry him he had to pay the bride price anyway presumably this would secure her some modicum of a future for having uh, a sum of money it's 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 a raw deal a bad deal but it's still some kind of a deal in a world where there were no such laws and basically the law of the jungle rule that you could just rape anyone and just walk away a law that required the rapist to take responsibility would be progressive but in the 21st century, majority of the world, where rape is clearly criminal, way up there with murder, to force the victim or even suggest that the victim marry 
a rapist is not progressive. So then, for biblical literalists, here is a conundrum. If it literally means that the law of Yahweh is eternal and not one jot or one tittle will pass away from the law, though heaven and earth pass away, then laws like this should still be enforced, shouldn't they? But if the Bible is not meant to be taken literally, in verses like this, where the rapist is commanded to marry his victim, where the victim is encouraged to marry her rapist, if we don't take this literally, then what else in scripture are we not meant to take literally? When you go bowling, there are two alleys on the left and on the right. One on the left and one on the right. <clears throat> and with all forms of, of extremism, there are usually two extremes, one on the left one on the right, far left, far right. So when it comes to biblical literalism, on one extreme are people that say everything needs to be taken literally. And on the other extreme are people that say these are all fairy tales and they should all be thrown out. These two extremes are extremes. They both do not embrace or even try to embrace the totality of truth. Because the fact is there are some things that cannot be taken literally, like outdated laws such as the victim should marry the rapist. But yet there are many things that still apply and presumably will always apply, such as laws requiring that the poor in the land be taken care of, such as laws requiring that foreigners be granted certain rights. There are many laws and beyond law, many truths, teachings about grace, about love, teachings about human nature. Well, let me not digress into details. What I want to say is that when I was a kid, I believed in biblical Literal, literalism. I was a biblical literalist. I now realize that the Bible itself was not written entirely as a literal document. Some of it is poetry, some of it is allegory, and some of it is hyperbole. Like when Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off. He did not mean it literally because he never told anyone to actually pluck out their right eye. Nor did he try to cut off anyone's right hand. Nor did he tell anybody to do that. The closest you come to that is when he told his disciples to get a sword, to get swords. And they found two knives because they were in a, a dining situation. Twelve disciples. He told them to arm themselves 
They found two knives for cooking, presumably, maybe for eating. And he said that's enough. Two knives for 12 men to defend him in the hour of darkness. Do you think he was being literal when he asked them to arm themselves with swords? So, obviously not. But then, Peter used the, the knife, or I don't know what kind of sword it was anyway, and he struck he struck the priest's, the high priest's servant's ear. He cut off his ear. Uh, and that was not a surgical strike. Peter was not a swordsman. He was a fisherman. He obviously was not trying to do ear surgery. He was not trying to amputate the servant's ear. He was going for the head. Probably to take him, take off the head at the neck. And the servant wasn't standing there as a stationary target to have surgery done on his ear. He probably flinched or ducked and Peter, instead of taking off his head at the neck, managed to take off his ear. And what did Jesus do? He said, stop. And then he took that ear and he put it back on the servant's head and reattached it. So how about that? I guess one, one pet peeve of mine is people who profess to be biblical literalists and people who complain that these young people nowadays pick and choose from the scriptures what they want to believe and why that pisses me off is because everybody does that. Everybody in every generation picks and chooses what they want to believe. In the Old Testament, for example, adulterers were meant to be put to death. And some of them were, but some of them were not. King David committed adultery and murder. And Nathan the prophet, what did he do? As a servant of God, as a prophet of the law, should he not have agitated for King David's execution? But he did not, did he? Instead, he told King David a story. Uh, let me not digress into the details of the story, but he told King David a story that it essentially made King David realize his guilt. And King David repented. And the fruit of his adultery with Bathsheba, that baby, died at birth. But then the second child from this adulterous relationship became King Solomon, the most powerful and richest king in the history of Israel. What do you make of that? Why was King David not put to death? He should have been put to death twice, once for adultery, once for murder, but he was not. So did not Nathan the prophet pick and choose what to apply? And has not the church in every generation picked and chosen what to believe and what to apply? For example, in church every Sunday in my church, Bangsar Duderin Church, by the way, my views are my views and not representative of Bangsar Lutheran Church or the Lutheran Church in Malaysia. Every Sunday, during the service, there's a time where we, when we go around and shake hands with whoever's around us and share the peace of God with one another. The Bible never says to shake hands, but that's what we do because that's what normal people do in the world nowadays. 
we shake hands. What does the Bible say? It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. We never do that in church on Sunday, not in my church. Not in any of the churches I've attended in my 42 years of life. Going to be 42. May 5th is my birthday if you want to send me something. I've never been in a church where we greet each other with a holy kiss. But that is a direct quote from the scriptures. Greet each other with a holy kiss. They just choose not to do that. So, I do not consider myself a biblical literalist. That's a mouthful. I do not put much value in biblical literalism anymore. What I do place a high value on is biblical literacy to understand what the Bible says, why it says it. And more important than what it says is what it means. That's why it's important.